Good afternoon, and welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. I'm the Reverend Monica Dobbins. I'm one of the ministers here, and it is my honor to welcome you to our church as we gather today to celebrate the life of one of our longtime members, Paul Train. If this is your first visit to our church, you are especially welcome here. We have two ushers at each door to help you find your way around or offer you assistance while you're here. If you need to use a restroom, the closest ones are right behind me in this hallway, but the easiest way to get there is through this door, take the hallway behind the chapel. And if you need access to a gender neutral restroom, please ask one of our ushers and they'll help you find it. Finally, our service today is being recorded and live streamed. We have hearing assistance devices in the narthex, if that would help you to experience the service. We do ask that you not try to access the live stream while in the chapel. It messes with our sound technology. Thank you, and once again, welcome. Worship in a Unitarian Universalist church begins with the lighting of the chalice, the sacred flame that for us represents the light of freedom in a world so often darkened by oppression and fear. It is a light that guides us to liberty and hope. Today, we light it for our dear friend, Paul. Let us light it with these words by the Unitarian minister, A. Powell Davies. When sorrow comes, let us accept it simply as a part of life. Let the heart be open to pain. Let it be stretched by it. All the evidence we have says that this is the better way. An open heart never grows bitter or if it does, it cannot remain so. In the desolate hour, there is an outcry, a clenching of the hands upon emptiness, a burning pain of bereavement, a weary ache of loss. But anguish, like ecstasy, is not forever. There comes a gentleness, a returning quietness, a restoring stillness. This, too, is a door to life. Here, also, is the deepening of meaning, and it can lead to dedication, a going forward to the triumph of the soul, the conquering of the wilderness, and in the process will come a deepening inward knowledge that in the final reckoning, all is well. I'm honored to speak to you today and tell you what I know about Paul Train. He was a man who accomplished the best of what many of us want for our lives, to come to terms with ourselves, to live with integrity, to love those around us deeply and be loved by them. I only met Paul in person once myself but in that one meeting, I could see what a funny, thoughtful, caring person he was. He had a sharp wit and a quick laugh. And even though at that time his health had become poor, he was engaging and delightful. He had stories to tell. <laughs> and I'm so glad that we'll get a chance to hear some of them today. Paul's daughter, Barbara, will tell you some of the stories of Paul's life, of being a dad and a teacher. And his brother will tell us some of Paul's young life growing up. 
But I want to tell you about Paul's great love story with his husband Richard, the life into which many of our church members had a glimpse. Paul's marriage with Richard spanned 14 years, and Richard remembered it to me as loving and gentle. He said they never argued in all that time, <laughs> though they didn't see everything eye to eye. These two were thoughtful and intentional about their relationship. They'd each been married before and wanted to be married again and be deliberate about their choices together. Paul and Richard dated for a year before they chose to become married and took that time to get to know each other. Richard remembered to me a day spent under the shade of a big tree at Liberty Park where each one of them made a list of their most important values, dreams, and goals. Then they swapped lists to see how compatible they were. Nowadays, couples do this on dating apps, so Paul and Richard were well ahead of their time. <laughs> their lists matched up astonishingly well, and they knew that they were a good match for each other, intellectually and emotionally. The couple used to take long driving trips together. Paul always had to be the driver, so Richard would navigate and read books aloud to pass the time. One particular trip took them to Yosemite. They were dismayed to discover, upon arriving, that the park was full of wildfire smoke. As they drove around, they passed a sign. The town they were in, Mariposa, was the county seat, and the county court head was, count courthouse was up ahead at the next turn. Why not stop in and get married? So that's what they did. The clerk found a couple of witnesses, and they eloped right there near Yosemite wearing t-shirts and sandals. <laughs> it wasn't an impulsive decision, though. They took a few minutes to talk it through, consider the pros and cons. And when they knew they were of one mind, Paul and Richard took the plunge together. There's not much else to do when the smoke is high, so they began to head home. And as they crossed over the mountain pass into Nevada, they looked at each other and realized they were no longer legally married. It would be another seven years or so before the true marriage of their hearts would be recognized everywhere. Coming out is a difficult thing for many people. We first come out to ourselves, which for some means recognizing that we can no longer live the life of someone that we're not, learning to be at peace with the person that we are, learning to look forward with joyful anticipation to the person we're yet to become. Paul experienced this process too, a process of releasing, accepting, embracing. He and Richard came to the Unitarian Church where they were embraced not in spite of who they are, but because of it. And we got to be blessed to be part, however small, in their grand love story. In days when love stories like this are threatened anew, we pause just to be grateful for people like Paul who demonstrate courage through the simple but enormously challenging lifetime work of being true to themselves. Richard was not Paul's only great love. Paul loved his wife and children deeply, loved the children he served in schools, loved his friends and his community. Living in integrity does not limit our capacity for love. On the contrary, it gives us a firmer foundation to love with authenticity, making our love more complex, richer, firmer, more real, more beautiful. We are grateful for people like Paul who believe in love, who believe in family, and want to share their love and receive love in return. 
Today, we are grateful to hear about a great love story in times when we need great love stories more than ever. And we mourn with family, with this family, and reassure them that even though Paul is no longer with us in body, the love will continue on forever. Amen. Thank you, David, for that beautiful music. And thank you, Reverend Monica, and everyone in the church that's helped um, make this day possible. Um, first of all, I want to thank those of you who are here. And for those who aren't, that have sent their love and comfort, it's appreciated. Today, I just want to share a few memories about my relationship with my dad. To begin, I've always felt a deep connection with my dad. I felt like his little buddy a lot of times as a child running errands and spending time together. As she mentioned, Reverend Monica, he was a teacher and he usually got home in the late afternoon and I don't think he was ever alone. He always had a child with him at all times and I'm grateful for that. I have wonderful childhood memories including family traditions, holidays, especially Christmas, dad taking care of the fire and playing Christmas music, and the smells of mom making breakfast. Summers in Lehigh were wonderful. The family reunions, the parade, and of course, the rodeo, I look forward to every year. And of course, the endless amounts of visits to relatives that never ended. He loved his family and loved genealogy. 
I remember going to great grandma and grandpa Lewis's home and he would turn to us in the back seat and he'd say, now grandma Ash, if you're hungry, say no. And of course, as soon as we got in the door, we'd say yes, and now she'd trot to go get us some treats. I loved um, hearing stories of how my parents met a dance class at BYU, as well as learning their journey to start a family. They were so happy to finally receive the phone call that they have a little boy to adopt, and four of us followed. I'm glad that my parents came to a place of gratitude for each other and respect. I remember one year, Dad wanted to bring our family closer, so he decided, which I now appreciate as a parent how expensive this was, for all of us to go skiing. And so all the equipment, all the clothes, to build our family and spend some good time together. And I remember it was a beautiful sunny day, and um, he said, you go do this run, and we'll meet here on the balcony, and we'll have lunch together. And of course, being probably 10 years old, I shredded Sesame Street slope, and I got down to the end, unhooked my bindings, and up on the deck, everyone had their skis and poles lined up. And of course, everyone was sitting outside because it was a beautiful day. Well, I did as I was instructed. I took my skis off. I came up to the deck, and I put them on the railing. And my dad and I, in horror, saw them fall like dominoes. All the skis and the poles into the snowbank below. And my dad said, stay here. I have some apologies to make. I realized he was a lot more patient than I probably was as a mother, but about that time, or maybe a little bit younger, I was on the swim team. And he would say, Barbara, please pay attention, watch the clock, and you need to be out here quarter after five. Yes, Dad, absolutely. And I would get in the car, and every day he said I was late. Every single day he said I was late, and I was watching that clock. In fact, during practice, I was staring at the clock, so I wasn't late. I came out again to the car, and he said, Barbara, I don't know what is going on. You're late every single day. I told you quarter after five, and my little tears came down my face, and I said, there's 25 cents in a quarter. I'm always here 25 minutes after five. <laughs> and he kissed me on the forehead, you sweet girl, you were on time every day. <laughs> Dad loved politics and instilled with me the importance of voting. As a little child, I remember him taking me and pulling the curtain and holding me up, and I would check the boxes or punch the holes. And in fact, after he was placed on hospice, he said, I just need to stay alive long enough to vote. It was very important to him. As a young adult, parent and child relationships change. We had some difficult times. There was a lot of hurt and pain. And with time, we both came to a place of acceptance, forgiveness, and love for both of us. And I'm grateful that our friendship continued. And I realized there was a sense of freedom when you let go of expectations and you appreciate what is. After I moved to North Carolina, I tried to come as, as often as I could, several times a year. Tried to call, but of course, now I know I didn't call enough. I would send Spaghetti Factory by DoorDash, and my dad thought it was witchcraft, like I was standing outside the door. <laughs> Richard loved Chinese, and dad loved spaghetti. So I tried to keep in contact. I knew when I came in February, Dad was declining. And we made the difficult decision to move. I want to thank you, Richard. 
for taking care of my dad. I'm sorry for your loss. Your commitment, companionship, friendship, and love has been beautiful to watch. When the hospice nurse called, what, 10 days ago, I don't even know what day it is, um, she said he was transitioning and I knew I needed to come home. I let my grown children know that I'd be coming to Salt Lake and without asking all four. came from Seattle, Pittsburgh, and Idaho to surround me with love. They all had to go home. I think they may be watching this. I am grateful. Dad knew at the end there was nothing but love. I'm grateful for those closest to me, both here and in North Carolina that have supported me and been my strength. I'm grateful to be your daughter, Dad, and I'll miss you. Oh my goodness, it's uh, an honor to take this uh, place at the pulpit today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Not only thank you for this opportunity, but thank you for all you've done for our family. And for, I am the little brother. Uh, Paul's mother lost Paul's father to congenital heart disease when Paul was, I don't know, five or six or seven, long in there. She then went to live with her parents in Lehigh. All this was in Lehigh. And uh, she went to live with her parents, uh, Grandpa, Morgan and Grandma Roosevelt, uh, two people of pioneer stock. And uh, Paul lived with them for a time. And uh, he shared with me recently that he didn't exactly feel comfortable. He, felt he knew that's where they should be. But uh, Grandpa was a man of uh, a little harsh, as you can imagine, in those days. And uh, maybe Paul wasn't coddled and nurtured, just quite like he wanted to be. And mother worked all the time. So Grandma Rose raised Paul and will be forever grateful for that. Uh, Paul's mother was named Barbara, and that's where Barbara's name comes from. Uh, during the time that she was alone, she began to uh, <coughs> date. Well, let me tell you, first of all, Paul's father was a jeweler, and he worked for Shoeback Jewelers in Salt Lake. And they, they had a glorious life together, only he got sick and died and left him alone. And uh, really, really hard times financially. So they went with Grandma and Grandpa. Now then, uh, during that time, she married my father, who was... Uh, 
another hard, harsh man of principle, a rancher, raised cattle in Lehi, altogether different personality than the jeweler in Salt Lake. And uh, he raised Paul, sent Paul on a mission, sent him to school, gave him opportunity for work. And uh, at the time, uh, and after, well, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. Uh, from that union, uh, you're looking at what came from that union, okay? And there's only one of me because they were older. They had been through the, yeah, my father had lost his wife also, and uh, they started out poor. They finally built a new home. Uh, we had a friend that said that they built that home one brick at a time. And uh, that's how they lived. Now then, uh, when Paul was my older brother, and he was the older brother that uh, everybody wanted to have, he treated me with utmost kindness. We shared, we shared a bedroom, we shared a bed, sometimes we shared towels. We uh, went, he took me everywhere with him. We didn't live far from the high school and we would walk to football games. Paul played in the high school band. I'd sit by him and I'd get to watch the football games, the basketball games, all of this kind of stuff. I was given privilege to because of my brother Paul. Uh, Paul had an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, he knew a lot about it. And when I'd get stumped on one of my questions, I'd call him and he'd straighten me out. He'd straighten me out. So. Uh, it turns out that as we, we got a little older and I married and had children, uh, Paul taught me how to ski. And we would go to Brighton on Saturday afternoon. He'd take his family, we'd take ours and go to Brighton in the glorious, glorious times. Uh, it just became too expensive, <laughs> and the Lehigh people couldn't afford it anymore. They had to do something else. Uh, our family had a great love and respect for your mother and the homemaker that she was, and uh, the seamstress that she was. She made my wife's wedding dress, and she and my mother were very close. Now Paul's mother, <laughs> while I was in Argentina serving a mission, uh, came down with cancer, and uh, they were very, took a lot of care. I was in 1971, and Paul came and stayed in the spare, spare bedroom, gave my dad a lift, and they wouldn't hear of telling me about it, and they wouldn't hear of me coming home. And so when I did come home, I came home to an ailing mother and Paul was such a great strength to our family in taking care of his mother. He loved his mother. And uh, 
He showed it in so many ways. Now, uh, I think it's only fitting that we remember good friends. Paul grew up in a neighborhood. We didn't live on the ranch at the time. We lived in town. Mother and dad bought a home they could afford. And we lived all there in, in uh, Lehigh City. And he had in the ward good friends. Uh, <clears throat> Carl Zimmerman, Bryant Strasburg, Merrill Beck, uh, Bruce Peterson, Bill Price, all in the same scout troop. And uh, very happy, very happy circumstances. And then uh, when Paul got sick and started to fail, Richard was such a good caregiver. Paul and I would visit on the phone and he would say to me, I want to go. He says, my bags are packed. I'm ready to go, but nobody comes and gets me. And uh, I'd say, oh, Paul, don't talk like that. And he goes, oh, I'm getting really, really tired. I'm getting really, really tired. And he says, you don't know how long it's been since I saw my father. And I want to go. And then, and then I, knew, I knew he was serious about this because he asked me, he said, uh, tell me again, tell me again what happens when I go. And I said, Paul, the, your mother and your father will come and get you and Morris and Grandma and Grandpa. And what a great reunion it will be. And it will be as easy as going through the door right here. And there you'll start over a new life. You'll leave your tattered body and you'll begin again. Uh, I'd like to share with you in regards to that what the prophet Alma said about that when, when we die. This is what happens when we pass away. And I've got to find my glasses. They're in here somewhere. These are the words of the prophet Alma. Now concerning the state of the soul between death and resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to the God that gave them life. And then it shall come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they shall rest from all their troubles, from all their care, and from all their sorrow. Now then, in some respects, when Paul was struggling, getting ready to go, he was struggling. I told Brent, in some respects, I envy that, that he is going to be with Mother again, with a twinkling of an eye. And uh, I bear you my testimony that I know that these things are true. I've had a lot of experience with death. And he just passed through the door. Uh, Uncle Paul. My brother Paul still lives on. I bear you that testimony and look forward to the day that I'll be his little brother again. 
and do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Barbara, Stan, thank you for sharing your words with us today. Thank you all for coming out together today to remember the life and love of Paul Train and to gather around his family in comfort and sympathy. You are invited to stay for reception in our fellowship hall, but for now, we close our service by extinguishing the chalice with these words by Wendell Berry. He goes free of the earth. The sun of his last day sets clear in the sweetness of his liberty. The earth recovers from his dying. The hallow of his life remaining in all his death leaves. Radiances know him, grown lighter than breath. He is set free in our remembering. Grown brighter than vision, he goes dark into the life of the hill that holds his peace. He's hidden among all that is and cannot be lost. Thank you.